thank you, Jesus, Lord, for this opportunity to come into your house today, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we to continue to put our eyes up on you today, Lord Jesus, Lord, worshiping you, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we stepped out of the world today, Lord, into uh, uh, the possibilities are unlimited today, Lord Jesus, Lord, because your presence, Lord, because this is your church, Lord. Lord, I thank you for each Sunday school teacher, each minister today, Lord Jesus. Lord, that they're not speaking on their own, Lord. You said if they open their mouth, Lord, that you'll speak through them, Lord Jesus. Lord, that I pray, Lord, that you use them in a mighty way today, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to give back a portion that you so richly bless us with, Lord. Bless this offering, this service, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother. Well, good morning. Amen. As adults, we're going to jump into the Word and uh, see what the Word has for us today. It always has something for us to be get a revelation, get an understanding, get some illumination into who our God is and the ways of our God and who we are. How many know we need an understanding of who we are in the light of who He is? And that's, a, that's something we need. <clears throat> well, our lesson, I want to welcome those that view us on the web. Amen. We are an apostolic church. We believe the word of God from cover to cover, from Genesis to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, one of the things we're going to deal with is about vows and oaths. And um, our Bible title tonight, or this morning I should say, is No Oaths Needed. And we're going to be dealing with two chapters and two different books. The first book we're going to go to is James chapter 5 verse 12. James tells us, but above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. That's pretty powerful words from the book of James. And you know James deals a lot about the tongue. And uh, he deals a lot about faith. And he deals a lot about putting that together, faith plus works. And that de deals with your deeds is... Um, is important because if you don't have that combination your faith is dead but the other chapter I want to deal with is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 33 through 37 Jesus said again ye have heard that it has been said of by them of old time thou shall not forswear thyself but shall perform unto the Lord thy oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, yes or no. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil, or the evil one. And this is what we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with about truthfulness. We're going to be dealing about communication. We're going to deal about God's way. And we know that Jesus said, I am what? The way. But he also said, I'm what? The truth and the life. And whatever Jesus does, it's true. And whatever he says is true. Here's what we have to deal with. We were sold out by our first parents. And now we have to struggle and deal with the other opposite 
of the truth of the matter and we have to deal with the struggle in our heart because our hearts have fallen from what we once knew and understood and now we are faced with the struggle of falsehood and, and doing things that are not right and lying and deception and you can see what the world is just spinning out of control because of all the falsehood that's in it. Satan has done his work. The master deceiver, the liar and the father of it, has completely blinded the eyes of humanity. And this is what we're going to be dealing with. I want to just say this before we go any further about Scripture. Scripture is true and it paints a picture of the reality and the revelation of the true God and it also paints the picture of us in a fallen state and us in a possible position of getting redeemed and reconciled with God so it's a beautiful picture of redemption and the love of God and the goodness of God but let's not forget when the scriptures are written, they are written to expose, amen, us. I don't care. Yeah, you might have a favorite character in the Bible, whether it be Abraham, whether it be David or such, but they all have flaws. And the scripture paints them out. It, it expresses it, and it, so we don't get into the mindset of just falling for a certain particular person and idolizing them there's one that is to be worshiped and that is the Lord himself all of us are in a situation wherever we are in God on our journey that we got to face the facts it's a struggle it's a journey of faith and in our struggle and in our valley there are mountaintop experiences there are victories and we must, the scripture says, overcome. I want to be the, of those that overcome. And part of overcoming is to be right with our words and communication. God's word says <clears throat> that when the Lord became flesh, the word was made flesh. The problem with humanity is it got so out of distortion and got into a believism a thinkism that was false and God saw to it that he was going to be the uh, avenue he was going to bring truth to mankind by stepping into the realm of men not just in the spirit but as a man and that to me is awesome don't you think that's awesome that God would do such a thing and that's one of the most beautiful things I think in scripture a lot of religions cannot comprehend that they will not believe that they say God is too glorious too powerful too too wonderful too big ever to consider to become a human being I know this for a fact as I've debated those that call themselves Jehovah Witnesses and they just shook their head and not possible they consider uh, Jesus Christ as just a mere angel equivalent to Lucifer. I mean, they have no conception of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you have a revelation of Jesus Christ, count yourself blessed. Because there are those that follow Jesus Christ that don't have a revelation of Jesus Christ. They're doing it out of just trusting the word but they don't come to the experience of the baptism of the spirit of a living God we call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we believe it we speak in tongues as the spirit of God gives utterance and I believe that the word speaking in tongues has a whole lot to deal with our words our words are us if a man is bound by his words, and he should be, amen, and this is why we get into this oaths and vows business. 
So don't take the scripture out of context. When we talk about, when we started in James 5, 12, let us understand James is talking about the tongue. And then he goes into talking about the testimony of Job. And then he says these things, above all things, say above all things, above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. And let us not forget Matthew 5, 33, part of our scripture is when he talks about, when Jesus talks about perform the oaths you give before God, but he also said, swear not at all. Don't bind yourself into something that you regret afterwards. You know, as a Christian, as a young Christian, you get all excited and you, you could take on the world. And you say, God, I'm going to do this. You know what I'm saying? You're making vows. You're making oaths. And then all of a sudden, you're finding yourself all the opposition that Satan gives, all the opposition that your family gives. If they're not apostolic, they don't understand. And so Jesus and James give us an understanding. Mind you. Don't take Matthew 5.33 out of context. Jesus just got done talking about marriage. And so let it, the scripture flow. And so marriage is the theme when he goes on to talking about um, your vows. We have a problem in America. The world has a problem. In the Christian faith, when we stand with our wife or our husband before God, before the minister of God, we take a vow. Do we not? And we say, well, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, health and in sickness, till death do us part. I mean, we vow before God. And the thing about it is, Marriage and family is where it all is. That is in a nutshell. When you don't have a structure of family in a society, the society will not and cannot succeed. What we're seeing in America is the results of sin and unbelief. And we're seeing the nation fall apart. And we're seeing it going into the opposite direction. And so when you leave the light, there's only darkness. And they're all going to fall into condemnation because, you know what? They're, they don't want to keep their word to the Creator. And they don't want to follow the truth in what the word reveals. And so... Above all things, swear not. In other words, don't put yourself in a situation that you cannot get out of. How many times have you promised your wife or your husband this or that? How many times have you, especially with the kids, the children, when you promise your children this and you don't keep your word? What kind of testimony is that to your children, your husband or your wife? And uh, more importantly, before God. Some people, I've seen it through the years, and by the grace of God, and I say by the grace of God, because I want to make it. But I don't want to be braggatocious and say, there's nothing that's going to stop me. Because Job, James just gets done talking about Job, and Job was put through the ringer. And when he was put through the ringer, I'll tell you what. Looking at the life of what happened with Job, I don't know if I could have done it. The purpose and plan of God was to allow this thing to happen as a testimony in Scripture to just pull back the curtain so we can see the real going-ons behind it and the reality of a human being going through extreme sorrow and grief and suffering. And yet, 
through the Lord's patience, mercy, kindness, Job makes it through it. And Job gets a clearer revelation of God. He didn't have a complete revelation of God because Job accused God of about, about 74 different things in his struggle. You ever wrestle with God? Be honest. I have. And uh, Job wrestled with God. Jacob wrestled with God. And uh, the thing about it is, once the wrestling's done and you surrender, good things happen. You get a clearer revelation of God and His ways and His purpose. And that's important because Jesus Christ is God after all. And His ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are beyond, way beyond our thoughts. And so, when we deal with this, this lesson, we got to understand when Jesus said, one jot or one tittle, dotting of the I, crossing of the T, if you will, is in no wise passed from the law till all be fulfilled. God keeps his word. God stands by his word. And he will not allow his word to go void. It will perform or do exactly what it was sent to do. It might not happen instantly. It might happen days, weeks, months, years down the road. But whatever God speaks, consider it done. Now, if there's a change of heart on the other end, then God can stop the judgment that was going to go towards that individual if he repents. God always responds to repentance. And Job, in the 30, I think it's the, I'm not sure, 38th chapter. Let's see. I think I wrote it down. Job, in the 38th chapter, repented. But I'm going to tell you something. All things are going to work out for the good if you love God. That's scripture. They're going to work out. If you love God, if you're wrestling with God like I am, then as long as you let him, finally, you get that revelation, you finally surrender to his will. And that's important. There is the will of God and there's the will of man. There is the ways of God, and there is the way of man. And when we get into this walk with God, and when we get into this journey of faith, it's, it's not what many think it is. Some say, oh, it's, a bed, it's like a road of, of roses, a bed of roses when you're, you know, finally get saved. <clears throat> no, you started on your journey when you got saved. And you're going to come to an understanding that you're goal is to know God and to know God sometimes it takes some well suffering sometimes it takes some things in your life that bring sorrow it all depends on the individual it all depends on the, the strength and the stubbornness of their will God is out for the good of mankind understand that it's us that's the problem God knows it God's long suffering towards us and so let's take back the veil in the case of Job let's understand some things about Job Job feared God he re revered God and the reason why I'm getting into this is because when James picks it up at chapter 5, verse 12, he just got done talking about Job. And so let's consider what's revealed in the Scripture and why God had Job written as a testimony because it's for our 
understanding. It's for our, uh, well, it's for our revelation, if you will. Amen. Because if we don't get it through the scripture, we're going to learn it through the lessons of life. i rather look at the scripture, learn from the scripture, see the errors of the people that are revealed, so I don't make the same mistakes. So I don't go down the same path. So I avoid the suffering and the heartaches that sin brings. You know, sometimes we, we think sin, we've got major sins. Yeah, but there's a lot of things in our life that we do that are sinful. And sometimes we don't see them for ourselves. Others might see them. And others might be critical of them, whether it be family, in, 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 in your natural blood family, or in the church of God. I mean, people see things that you don't see. Let's face it. We have blind spots. And in order to get beyond the blind spots and for us to know us and see the man in the mirror, it takes God to do it. You know, sometimes our enemies reveal it to us in the, in, in the light of what David's life. Sometimes our own brethren, family, reveal those things to us. But a good man or a good woman, amen, come to the revelation and understanding of who they are in the light of who he is and in the light of who your brethren are and family are, it takes a real Christian. To be Christ-like is a Christian. It takes a real Christian to get and understand these things and correct these things so one doesn't think the wrong way, one doesn't speak the wrong way, and one doesn't carry out actions and deeds the wrong way towards their brother, sister, or God himself. Oaths, vows, they're important. Your words are important. Let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. Don't swear by the city of God, by the word of God, by, by God himself. Or Don't make an oath. Avoid it. Yes, you've got a commitment to God. I'm going to serve God no matter what. But don't be prideful and say, I can do it on my own. That's prideful. That's self-righteous. Job thought he could do it on his own. Job was prideful. Job, according to what the scriptures reveal, is, was self-righteous. But in the end, he repented. It's by the grace of God that we are what we are. And we're going to get through all this by the grace of God. Simple as that. And um, let's see, well, just for instance, we understand in the book of Job that there's a real enemy. There is a Satan. There is an evil one. There is a deceiver. And we got light of that in Genesis and through Adam and Eve. We understand that, we, that Adam and Eve were developed a relationship with God. They had a walk with God. And yet this stranger comes in their garden, their paradise, and he starts speaking opposite things, declaring that what God, and he didn't say right out that God's a liar, but he, he basically said, hey, you don't have to believe God. It's not going to happen that way. And they took the bait. Line, sinker, bait, it all. And they sinned against the Almighty. They basically, in their temptation, they revealed to God that God cannot be trusted. That God is capable of deception and lies. And when they did that, there was consequences. Because the deceiver accomplished what he went to accomplish. He deceived them and they sinned against 
the Almighty, and it cost them paradise. It cost them sorrow. It cost them, well, I don't know what Eve went through childbirth, but it cost her to be greatly multiplied sorrow in her childbirth. It cost them getting kicked out. It cost them that they're going to die. They had no access to the tree of life. And you know what? It cost a human family tremendous sorrow, tremendous grief, tremendous things that cannot even be uttered because of what people go through in life. Sickness, disease, anguish, wars. And you can go on and on and on about the human family. And Job paints us a picture where the evil one, that nasty creature that sinned, with pride in his heart when there was no devil the biggest loser of all in creation because he had it all and he lost out with God because of his pride his evil to rebel against his creator and so the, he lost out but he has no redemption we lost out, but we have the possibility of redemption because we got a God of mercy and grace that extends his hand, amen, and by the blood and by the cross, we have access, praise God, to him because the scriptures declare it and they can be trusted. And he is the rock of our salvation. We see in Scripture, we get an understanding in Scripture that God allowed things to happen in Job's life for a purpose. And the goal through it all was to give us who read this testimony, amen, an understanding about what's behind the scenes and what is the purpose of this all and that Job was not what many perceived that he was he was not perfect in his understanding about God or his fellow man he argued and he wrestled amen against his fellow man his friends think about this Job lost his children he lost his wealth he lost his friends he had his wife give up in her grief and her sorrow and tell him, hey, curse God and just die. That's powerful. They're, they must have been in such a, a, a place that I can't even explain because I've never been in that place. That's a dark place. And um, Job held on for all he had. To the, he got his revelation but it took 38 chapters it was not an easy thing and when he started expressing his self-righteousness and expressing his argument that God is wrong for judging him this way listen to what some of the things he said in Job Job 32 1 through 2 he says he was he was righteous in his own eyes and he justified himself rather than God I mentioned that there are 74 things about 74 things he said against God but of course understanding that he was under tremendous grief and sorrow and suffering in other words he just let it out The Lord taketh away. That was one of his expressions. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Well, that was wrong. 
the Lord is not a thief. In fact, Jesus said, let me straighten that out with you disciples. There is a thief, and that thief's come to rob, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. That's who he is. You know, but God is not that way. God is one that brings life, abundant life, and brings redemption. God is not a thief. Yes, God allowed the thief to do what he did. But the concept of man is, you know, when we have a tremendous hurricane or tornado, oh, it's an act of God. But when you see plainly that it was the devil, when it comes to Job, that caused the lightning and the wind and all that stuff to come against Job and his house. And when Jesus was on the ship and the disciples woke him up because they thought their lives were in jeopardy, Jesus rebuked the storm. You think Jesus would rebuke God if God was involved in that storm? Or who do you think was really involved in the storm? Who was the one that wanted to kill the disciples? Satan. And so when Jesus rebuked the storm, he said he rebuked it, he muzzled it. He shut it up. Our perspective on God needs to be clearer. So when we do make a vow or an oath as far as a marriage is concerned, or a commitment to God that we understand what we're doing. We're stepping into the realm that we better keep what we say. And Jesus says, avoid some things. Don't go swearing by God's throne. Don't do it by, his, by God's footstool or by the city of God. Because, see, the Jews and the religious life that it was, they would make oaths and they would make vows or things. You remember when, when um, Saul of Tarsus was doing his, what he was, uh, well, Saul of Tarsus had a conversion, and when he converted to Christianity and started following Christ, there was a bunch of men that made a vow. And what was that vow to do? Kill him. I think they shaved their heads. They made an oath. And they said, no matter what, we are making a vow. We're going to kill this Saul of Tarsus. Why? Well, because it was of the devil. They were blind to what was happening in Saul's life. Saul was going, according to God's purpose and plan, Saul was going to be the Apostle Paul, an evangelist, a powerful vessel to be used of God. And so they were mindless and clueless of it. Just like Saul of Tarsus was blind to who Jesus was in the followers of Christ because he was wreaking havoc with the church. And he got papers from the high priest and no doubt made a vow to destroy the church because he thought it was not the will of God. He thought it was opposite of the traditions of their elders and their priests. Let me go back into I want to talk about. It is Satan that deceives. It is Satan that lies. It is Satan, amen, that tries to rob humanity of having a relationship with God. It is Satan's will that he would try to kill anything in that relationship and utterly destroy that soul. If he can just make them think wrong, make them say things and do things wrong, and just live their life completely opposite of what God wants. There are people... The scripture says that 
with crying are enemies of the cross. They have started their journey, possibly, and through the tribulation, through the trials, through the things that Satan does in stumbling blocks and such, through people or through spirits, they have turned to be enemies of the cross. Well, I'm speaking to a group of people that have been on the journey for some time. I'm speaking to a group of people, and I hope on the web they have an understanding that God is not a thief. He's not come here to rob you, kill you, or destroy you. It is your choice in life to walk by faith and not by sight. It is your choice in life, and it's important for you to have a revelation of God, to see God for who he is and know his ways. Israel knew the miracles of God, according to the psalmist, but they did not know the ways of God. Moses, no doubt, knew the miracles and the power and all the testimonies that, that they had with God, but the Scripture says that Moses knew the ways of God. How many times in the Old Testament did, did God say, you, you, you're not following my ways, you don't know my ways? The ways of God are important. To know him and know his ways, you're going to have a good relationship with God because you're going to know where not to go and where to go. You're going to have what the scripture says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. I'm not here going to be lost. And Jesus talks about a lost condition. Jesus talks about a dark, being in darkness. You, if you don't have the word to bring you the light, if you don't have the spirit to give you the understanding and to bring about the understanding to where to walk by faith and not by sight. Job was in the condition that he was wrestling with God and he did accuse God. And I'm not going to say anything I'm not going to point fingers. I don't want to ever be in that situation because I don't know how, if I would come out of it. I have suffered things. You have suffered things. I've gone th through sorrow and grief and asked God why and got no answer. But I also understand maybe it's just not for me to know. And just to continue on. Jacob, his name was changed into Israel. He got a blessing. He really struggled and wrestled with God about things. But in the end, God won out. Jacob surrendered and did the will of God. And Israel was born as a nation under God. And so that's a beautiful thing. Job, in his struggle, in the, and it goes on to talking, <clears throat> he says this. Job says, um, God destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. See, Job only knew what he knew. And as far as he was concerned, who was the destroyer, Satan or God? God destroyeth the perfect. Listen, Job, you're not perfect. You might be perfect in your own eyes, but you're not perfect. You got blind spots. You got situations in your heart that need clarification. Every Christian in this building better understand you're a sinner saved by grace. You better understand that pride goes before a fall. You better understand that it's by the grace of God you're going to get through your trials and your tribulations in life. And if you have that understanding, 
You're in the light because you're looking at the person you are in the mirror and you're seeing you for what you are. And you know what? You need to see the reflection of Jesus Christ of what you can become. And that's where your eyes need to be. Seeing Jesus for who he is. Knowing that you are there with this mirror and you're not seeing you but you're seeing him and you got a ways to go trust me <laughs> I've got a ways to go and I've been on this journey I got a ways to go to be like him and I'm on my way step by step for the good steps or, or the steps of a good man are what ordered by the Lord I don't want to go down this path, Lord. But the Lord's saying, you're going down this path. Sorry, I just felt the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know where you are in life. <laughs> but I know where I am. And the Lord says, this is the path you're going to take. But I made a commitment a long time ago. Lord, I'm going to serve you no matter what. I pray that I can keep that commitment, that vow before the Lord. I know it's not going to be by my own will because I don't have the strength to do it, friend. I don't have the ability to do it on my own. But what I have is Jesus Christ, and because of Jesus Christ, I can take them steps of faith, and I can go through what I got to go through in life. You ask the Christians that had a face in the early church that they had to face tremendous persecution. It, it cost them their life, their wealth, their everything to be a a Christian back in that day but they were willing to do it and they paid the price and you know what in these last days we don't know what we're going to be faced with honestly we don't know if we're going to be here you know I I don't know what's going to be there for us. But one thing I know who holds my future, my tomorrows, and that is Jesus Christ. And if I just trust him, and I emphasize trust him, he'll get you through it. Because all things are going to work out for the good to them that are called and according to his purpose you love if you love him and are called according to his purpose his purpose is for the good it worked out for the good of job when he got done he got a revelation of god in chapter 38 when he saw the lord not just by the hearing of the ear that he heard about the things of god don't forget there was no bible in job's day it is considered pretty well among the scholars that Job was the first book written among books the 66 books that we have that are recorded all Job knew about was through the hearing of the ear but through it all in the 30th chapter when God appeared on the scene Job didn't accuse God instead the scripture says that Job repented. Now think about that. The sorrow, the grief, the pain of the boils and all that was that he went through. That Job repented before God of the things he'd said and the things he thought. Job got a revelation Job got some illumination Job a man's life was blessed after he repented 
He had more than he had previously. What, double the amount? He had beautiful daughters. He had wealth. And he had long, long life. I, I, what do you, I, I forget what the age, what, 150 years old or something he lived to. He saw many generations, amen, of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. And the life of Job is demonstrated and the testimony of Job is demonstrated for us to have an understanding. Because after... James talks about Job. It goes in to say, hey man, above all things, swear not neither by heaven nor neither by earth nor by uh, uh, an, another oath. Let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. Don't fall into condemnation. Don't be a braggart. Don't be boastful. Don't be prideful. All those things were an example of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the lawyers. and These guys were full of self-righteousness. Describing, Jesus described the Pharisee with the publican. He said, hey, what would you think? Who's more justified? The one who swears by heaven and says, you know, I'm glad I've tithe and I do this and I do that boastful prideful and I'm not like that publican and then you got this publican don't even look up to heaven just oh God man I'm not right God I, I'm a sinner God I, you know, Jesus says I'll tell you the one I look at I look at that one the one that humbled himself before me the one that realizes who he is in the mirror. Not this one that's prideful. Not this one that's boastful. Not this self-righteous. Well, I'm, I'll just stop there. Consider this. Example after example after example through the Scripture. Those that have, you know, boasted and no doubt made all kinds of oaths and made vows to God and, and you think about this. We call this uh, the prodigal son. That's what we label it as. But I don't label it that way. I see it from a different view. I see it from God's view. God's view is it's focused on the daddy. It's focused on the father. That's where really the focus needs to be. He has two sons. And yeah, we focus on the prodigal one. Because, you know, he's the bad guy. You know, he's the, he's the sinner. But, you know, what is the spirit of the son that stayed with the father? Is it a good spirit? Or is it a self-righteous, merciless son? He had no mercy for his other brother. He could care less about his brother. He considered him dead as far as he was concerned. He wouldn't reach out his hand. He wouldn't help him. He wouldn't do nothing. But you got the father. Man, he loves his sons. I'm going to tell you, this is a perfect picture of what God deals with when he deals with his children. You got those that are... In the middle, they're balanced Christians. They see the light. They understand who they are in the mirror. They understand that they're not going to be boastful and prideful. They understand they're going to be merciful and they're going to reach out with love. They understand the heart of Jesus Christ. And they are made it their purpose in life to be like and conform to him. Then you got those on the far left. Man, they're going to think, well, we can do anything we want and be right with God. Because we always can get back to God when we're at the bottom of the rung, when the bottom of the barrel. We could always go back to God because God's merciful. And you got that frame of thinking. Then you got those that are self-righteous religious people. And they get into the frame of mind, well, you know what? I've been faithful. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, and that. And they carry it on and carry it on. And the thing about it is they're both wrong. 
who was the one that put Jesus on the cross? Well, both did. You had the self-righteous Pharisees, amen, that when they were exposed, didn't like what they saw and wanted to put the light out. And they did. They murdered Jesus Christ. But, of course, they're, they're clean. They, you know, we're not going to do it. We're just going to make it happen. But we'll let those sinners, those Gentiles, carry out the execution. Got the picture? Two different extremes. I'll tell you what. That's the problem with Christianity. Not in its true light. But because of ministers that don't have any illumination and revelation of God, number one. Don't understand the plan of salvation, number two. But are doing, and they're doing what they think is right in their own eyes. And they're wrong. And you got the people that think they can do just about anything they want and be Christians. And they set out a poor example to the world. And the world looks at Christianity as a bunch of mixed up people. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. They say this. They believe that. There's such a different. There's just a confused people. And then you got apostolics. And they're right. They're right in their doctrine. And then you got them that are just wrong in their spirit. And that's where we need to be careful. And that this, this lesson is coming to a conclusion. We need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful what we do. We need to be careful what we think. And get down to the root of it, you know, we need to see us in the mirror for who we are and understand the goal is Jesus Christ. He's the one we're to conform to. He's the one we're to act out our faith with. And looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher or completer of our faith. This is where it needs to go. But let us be mindful. Don't be braggadocious. Don't swear this or that, you know, because it all ends up costing you, and it could put you in a place where you fall under condemnation, and you get into the realm of darkness and the devil. Understand that you are a child of faith, you live by faith and not by sight. You understand that you are a sinner saved by grace and you're to do good. Say do good. For not to do good is what? Sin. But lawlessness. And God's kingdom is run by law. Rules. And, but it's done by the spirit of grace and love. I'm going to conclude this lesson. We're going to go further on in the service to worship our great God and Savior. And uh, let's do that. Let's fellowship with one another, realizing who we are and who our great God is. Amen.